Hey everyone, and welcome back to On The Spot STEM. So since the F equals MA is coming up really soon, we've decided to do a 25 minute quick review on the concepts in the F equals MA you should know. In this video, we're not going to solve any past F equals MA problems. We're just going to go over the concepts that we think appear on the F equals MA the most and what we think are the most important. So first, some information about the test. This is a 75 minute test with 25 multiple choice questions. Calculators are allowed, but you may not use your own graphing calculators. There's five answer choices per question and you get one point per correct answer and zero for leaving the question blank or getting the answer wrong. So that means you should always put an answer choice for each question. The cutoff for USIFO, the next level, is around 14 through 18 problems on the F equals MA, and only about 400 people out of the 6,000 test takers last year qualified. The average score is 8 out of 25, so don't feel that bad if you don't do as well as expected. Without further ado, let's dive into our content. The first topic is dimensional analysis. Sometimes deriving a solution using physics principles may be too difficult or too time consuming for the 75 minutes you're given on the test. In these cases, it's better to look at the answer choices and see which one dimensionally makes sense. Or in other words, which choice has the units that correspond with the quantity requested. And to do this, you should be comfortable with the units of all physical quantities, like length, velocity, acceleration, force, work, and power, in addition to linear density, surface area density, and volume density. The units for these values can be easily derived, and I highly recommend that you remember them. One topic that the F equals MA has been throwing at us more recently is air propagation. F equals MA wants you to know how to measure the uncertainty of given expressions or formulas if you're given the uncertainties of the other individual variables. So here are the rules that you should know and learn how to apply. So the addition rule. The uncertainty of z is simply the square root of the sum of the squares of the other uncertainties if x plus y equals z. The multiplication rule. If z equals x times y, then the uncertainty of z over z, which is basically the percent uncertainty, is equal to the square root of the percent uncertainty of x and the percent uncertainty of y. And the last one, the power rule. If z is equal to some function, then the uncertainty of z is simply given by f prime of x, which is the derivative of f with respect to x, times the uncertainty of x. And this one just simply follows from some calculus. Rule 3 is less important to remember than rules 1 or 2, but it may come in handy if you're dealing with a bunch of powers. Our next topic is kinematics. The most important part of kinematics are the big 5 equations. For each of these equations, you should either memorize them or be able to derive them quickly. The big 5 equations describe how a particle moves in a constant acceleration. Each of these big five equations is missing one variable. So that means that if you have a problem where you're given three variables and you want to find the fourth unknown one, you can look at these equations for the variable that you do not care about and use that equation to solve for that fourth variable. But this is only for a constant acceleration. For a changing acceleration, we're gonna have to use calculus to solve for the position, velocity, and acceleration. Luckily, the F equals MA does not test you on calculus, so you don't really need to remember these. And another key thing to remember is that these equations, both the constant acceleration ones and the changing acceleration ones, are not limited to only one dimension. As long as you know what you're doing, you can apply them to the Y direction or the Z direction. Next, we move on to projectile motion. Projectile motion is basically two-dimensional kinematics because there's zero acceleration in the x-direction and constant acceleration downward 
in the y direction. And that constant acceleration downward is 9.81 meters per second squared, or what we call little g. So the velocity in these types of problems is usually at an angle with respect to the axes, what we call theta, and we can use this velocity and the constant acceleration to solve for the time of flight, the maximum height reached, and the horizontal range. And we can do this by looking at the x velocities and the y velocities. Make sure you know how to derive these three equations because they appear very frequently in projectile motion problems. But projectile motion doesn't always have to be on a level surface. In this video, we'll examine what happens when a particle is launched on an incline of angle phi. What we do in this problem is there's still constant acceleration straight downward, but there's no acceleration to the left or to the right. So what we can do here is shift the axes so that the x direction is along the plane and the y direction is normal to it. And in that case, we can get the x acceleration, the y acceleration, the x velocity, and the y velocity. And this basically becomes another projectile motion problem except with acceleration in the x direction and you can solve this quite easily. Next, let's dive into forces. The concept that is most important to forces is Newton's three laws. Newton's first law says a body will remain at rest or at constant velocity unless it is acted upon by a net external force, which means that if a body is at rest or moving at a constant velocity, then the net force on that object is zero. Newton's second law states that F equals MA, or the net force is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of that object. This is also useful for solving statics and dynamics problems. Newton's third law says, if two bodies exert a force on one another, the forces are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Note that these action-reaction pairs act on different objects, which means that objects themselves still can have a net force acting upon them. This is a really important concept that you must understand. A tool for solving force problems are free body diagrams, which are diagrams that show the forces acting on an object in the correct directions. So here's an example of a free body diagram with four forces acting upon it. As you can see, the net force acting on that object is 17 newtons in the positive x direction. Some important forces that you need to memorize are the gravitational force, or the weight is equal to mg, where g is the gravitational constant. The next one is the spring force, or f is equal to negative kx. The k is the spring constant, and x is the displacement that the spring was given. The negative sign is there to show that it's a restoring force, which means that the further you pull on a spring in one direction, the harder the force will pull back in the other. The last one is the centripetal force, which is given by F equals M times the centripetal acceleration, or MB squared over R, which means if you're traveling around a circle with radius R and you're going a velocity V, that means that the force needed to keep you moving in that circle is just MV squared over R. Some common types of force problems are ones related to inclined planes. For inclined planes, just like projectile motion up a ramp, you split the axes and split the force components in the direction of the plane and normal to the plane. In frictionless pulleys, the tension of the string is the same on both sides, and you can find the relationships between the accelerations of the blocks on the pulley by considering what happens when you extend one length of a rope by x and what happens to all the other blocks. For frictional problems, all you have to do is plug it in into two simple formulas. The formula for static friction is f of s is less than or equal to mu s fn, where f of s is the force of static friction, mu s is the coefficient of static friction, and fn is the normal force, which is the force that the surface pushes on the object. The static friction takes a maximum value of mu s fn, but it doesn't always reach that place because static friction always keeps the object at rest. 
Kinetic friction is always a constant value if you're given a constant coefficient of kinetic friction or a normal force. And one thing to note is that friction always opposes motion. For work and energy, the key concept is that energy is always conserved. It can be converted into different forms, from heat to potential energy to kinetic energy, and it can flow from one body to the next. For example, when there's friction, the energy isn't lost, it's just dissipated as different forms, like as heat energy or as sound energy or whatnot. The work that a force applies on an object is given by the dot product of the force vector and the displacement vector, or more simply, F times S times cosine theta, where theta is the angle between the force and the direction of motion. Kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mv squared, where m is the mass of the object and v is the speed of the object. And this is a very important equation that you should definitely remember and know how to manipulate to solve problems. Another common form of energy that you see is gravitational potential energy. It's given by mgh where g is the gravitational constant and h is the change in height that the object goes through. Some common theorems that you should remember is the work energy theorem, which states that any change in work applied to an object is the same as the change in kinetic energy that the object has. The spring potential energy is given by u equals 1 half kx squared, and this can be easily derived from the formula f equals negative kx, when you can integrate the force function to find the potential energy. The spring potential energy function is also a really common one that appears on the F equals MA. Conservative forces are forces that produce the same work no matter which path you take to get from one endpoint to the other endpoint, just as long as the endpoints are the same. So in the picture to the right, the green path and the blue path all take the same amount of work because the energy at the top and the energy at the bottom are the same. And an example of conservative forces is gravity. Non-conservative forces depend on the path that the force takes you, and an example of this is friction. Depending on where the path is, the frictional force might produce a greater amount of work loss or a lesser amount of work loss. And potential energy graphs. The key thing here is to remember that du, or the change in potential energy, is negative remember the negative sign, of the force times dx, or the change in displacement. Now moving on to momentum, the key thing in this unit is that in a system with no net external force, momentum is always conserved, where momentum is given by mv. A key concept in momentum is the center of mass, which is given by the equation to the right. This is for a two-body equation, but a very similar equation exists for objects with more than two bodies. When we say that in a system, a momentum is always conserved, we mean that the velocity of the center of mass is always constant, which means that whatever the right side adds up to, m1v1 plus m1v2, and so on, if there's no net external force, the velocity of the center of mass will always be the same. And this also applies to collisions. The momentum before the collision is the same as the momentum after the collision. Now there are two types of collisions. There's elastic collisions, which means that kinetic energy of the two objects is conserved, and inelastic equations, which means that the energy is not conserved. In perfectly inelastic collisions, the objects stick together and that's when the system loses the most energy. Another key concept in momentum is force versus time graphs. In a force versus time graph, where force is on the y-axis and time is on the x-axis, the area under the curve is simply equal to the impulse or the change in momentum. Torque and angular momentum is perhaps the most important physics topics in mechanics because it combines everything that you've learned previously. Torque and angular momentum is just force and momentum, but for rotating objects. There are similar calculations and concepts, and Newton's three laws still apply to rotating objects. There are the big five equations for rotation as well, except with theta instead of x, omega instead of v, and alpha instead of a, where theta is the angular displacement, omega is the angular velocity, 
and alpha is the angular acceleration. And note that t still remains in these equations. In the big five equations, there are four variables in each equation, which means that if you know three variables, you basically do the same strategy as the kinematics equation, and you can solve for the fourth variable by picking your equation carefully. The equation for torque is r cross f, or it's rf sine theta in the direction given by the right hand rule. To figure out what this rule is, you point your fingers in the direction of r, and you curl them in the direction of f. You shouldn't curl more than 180 degrees, and whatever direction your thumb is pointing in perpendicular to the plane that r and f are in is the direction of the torque. Torque is also given by the moment of inertia i times the angular acceleration alpha, and the moment of inertia is basically the rotational equivalent of mass. Torque equals i alpha is a very important equation for solving dynamic problems involving forces and torques. Moment of inertia is something that you should memorize. Here are some common moment of inertia equations to the right. If you don't know how to derive them quickly, I suggest you memorize them because they appear very often on mechanics problems. Angular momentum is given by the moment of inertia times the angular velocity omega. Some other key concepts for the rotation unit is rolling without slipping. When a circular object is rolling without slipping, the linear velocity of the center of mass is r times omega, where r is the radius of that object. And the acceleration of the center of mass is r times alpha. The rotational kinetic energy equation, a formula that you should know and should know how to relate with the linear kinetic energy equation using the rolling without slipping conditions, is k equals 1 half i omega squared. And just like linear momentum, Angular momentum is conserved in the absence of net external torques, and the torque of a system is simply equal to the sum of all the torques acting on that system, or I times the net angular acceleration. Torque and angular momentum don't just stop with rotating objects. For objects in equilibrium, which means that there's no net force and no net torque, you'll still need the torque and force equations to balance the object out. One trick for these equilibrium problems are that there is zero net torque about any pivot point for objects in equilibrium, which means that you can pick the pivot point where it's most convenient to figure out and sum your torques. Equilibrium doesn't mean an object isn't moving, the object can be spinning or rotating at a constant rate. It's when it's accelerating or angularly accelerating that the object is not in equilibrium. You'll also be asked to solve for equilibrium in objects in an accelerated reference frame. And in that case, instead of summing the equations to be equal to a final m times a at the end, you can add a fictitious ma coming from the center of mass in the opposite direction of the acceleration and factor that in when you're trying to find the equilibrium net forces and net torques. This trick is extremely useful for objects in accelerating reference frames. Now moving on to gravitation. There's a formula for the gravitational force between two objects of mass m1 and m2. The force is given by g times m1, the mass of the first object, times m2, the mass of the second object, over r squared, where r is the distance between these two objects. And this equation is true for the types of problems that you'll see on the f equals ma. Remember in the projectiles unit when I said that gravitation was a constant? Well, that's only for objects that move a relatively small distance compared to the radius of the Earth. The constant big G in this equation is given by 6.673 times 10 to the negative 1 newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. And I believe the F equals MA does give you this constant on their formula sheet in the front of the booklet. And something you should remember is that gravitational force is a vector and it's always pointing towards the other mass. And that's because objects attract each other. Gravitational force never repels objects from each other. The gravitational field is given by g times m over r squared, where m is the mass of whatever is producing the field and r is the distance from that mass. 
To sum gravitational forces together, it's basically the same thing as summing vectors. The gravitational potential energy can be derived from the gravitational force, and it's given by negative g big M little m over r. And using gravitational potential energy, we can derive the escape velocity. When the kinetic energy plus the potential energy is equal to zero, the velocity in that equation would just be equal to the escape velocity. You don't need to remember the escape velocity because it's pretty easy to derive using basic physics principles. Some key conceptual topics in the gravitational units is Kepler's three laws. Kepler's first law states that a planet moves around a star in an elliptical orbit, and this is basically determined by the r squared in the denominator of the gravitational equation. Kepler's first law also states that the sun is at one of the foci of the ellipse, which means that the object travels around the edge of an ellipse with the star at one of the foci. Kepler's second law states that a line connecting the planet and the star sweeps out equal areas in equal times. In the diagram to the right, this is demonstrated by the two blue areas. In the portions where the planet is traveling closer to the sun, it's also traveling faster, which means that it would cover more distance overall. And when the planet is further from the sun, it travels slower, so the areas would balance out and become equal to each other. And this law is derived using the conservation of angular momentum. It does not depend on the r squared in the gravitational equation. Kepler's third law states that the orbital period squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. And we actually have an explicit formula for that. t squared equals 4 pi squared over gm times a cubed, where a is the semi-major axis, or the big axis divided by 2. Kepler's third law is relatively easy to derive as well for a circular orbit, and all you really need to know is that it still holds for an elliptical orbit. The total energy of an orbit is given by negative g big M little m over 2a, where a is still the semi-major axis. If you know this formula, it could save you tons of time as you wouldn't need to plug through the conservation of angular momentum and the conservation of energy to find the velocities of a planet in an elliptical orbit. And since the formula for the force of gravity has an r squared in the denominator of the equation, it follows the inverse square law. And there are three key properties there. The first is the shell theorem, which states that if you're inside a uniform spherical shell, the net gravity that you feel is equal to zero. While if you are outside that uniform spherical shell, the gravity that you feel is the same as the gravity you would feel if all that mass was concentrated at that center of mass. The other two properties follow from the first and third Kepler's laws, the elliptical orbit and the square cube law. Let's move on to a topic that does not appear in regular high school physics courses, fluids. Before we understand fluids, we need to understand what pressure is. Pressure is equal to the force divided by the area. When we're talking about fluids in a high school physics course or the F equals MA, we're talking about an ideal fluid, a fluid that's incompressible, which means that the density is constant, irrotational, which means that the flow is smooth and no turbulence, and non-viscous, which means that the fluid has no internal friction. The pressure at a depth h under the surface of the fluid is given by rho gh, where rho is the density of the fluid, g is the gravitational constant, and h is the depth that we're talking about. And the buoyant force, the force that the fluid pushes up on you, is given by rho vg, where rho is the fluid density, v is the volume of the fluid displaced, and g is the gravitational constant. And you might notice that rho v is simply the mass of the fluid displaced, which means that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced, and that is the core of Archimedes' principle. The next few equations are only for ideal fluids. The continuity equation states that a1v1 equals a2v2, where a1 and a2 are the cross-sectional areas at two points, and v1 and v2 is the velocity of the fluid at those two points. And this 
follows from the conservation of mass of a fluid. Since the mass of the fluid cannot change, the volume cannot change because the density is constant, so this equation must hold. The second equation is Bernoulli's principle. P1 plus 1 half rho V1 squared plus rho G H1 is a constant. And this follows from the conservation of energy. These are the most important equations for ideal fluids that you should remember. Now let's move on to what I consider the hardest concept of mechanics, oscillations. The most fundamental oscillation is simple harmonic motion, which is defined when the restoring force is proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction. One example of this is for springs, which is given by F equals negative KX. Since F equals MA, A depends linearly on x and the negative sign means that it's a restoring force which means that springs have simple harmonic motion another example is for simple pendulums at a small angle the small angle is so that we can approximate sine theta equals theta and when we draw the free body diagram for the pendulum we find that the angular acceleration or the acceleration in the simple pendulum case is equal to a negative constant times the displacement the acceleration is also equal to negative omega squared times x, where omega is the angular frequency of that simple harmonic motion. For springs, the angular frequency is simply the square root of k over m. To solve for the period and the angular frequency of a simple harmonic motion, we can just draw a careful free body diagram and make simplifications when necessary. The period is equal to 2 pi over the angular frequency and frequency is equal to the angular frequency over 2 pi. All the equations are in the red box to the bottom left but the only important ones that you should remember are the ones for how angular frequency relates to the frequency and the time. We're almost done here. Waves rarely appear on the f equals ma but it's good to know what they are. Transverse waves oscillate perpendicular to the direction of motion, while longitudinal waves oscillate parallel to the direction of motion. The wavelength of a transverse wave is equal to the velocity over the frequency of that wave. And the velocity of a transverse wave is equal to the square root of the tension over the linear mass density of whatever the wave is traveling through, where the linear mass density is just the mass over the length of that object. There's an important concept for waves, the fundamental frequencies, but they don't really appear that often on the f equals ma. All you really need to know is that if the ends of the rope are kept in place, the frequency of the waves in that string is equal to multiples of the fundamental frequency, where the fundamental frequency is the frequency of the wave with the wavelength of twice the length of that string. Again, this doesn't really appear that often, but it's still good to know. And that's it. We didn't go over any problems, but these are most of the concepts that appear on the F equals MA. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. And good luck for those of you who are taking the F equals MA.